we've got we've got Janelle and Sonia with us who are our guests and they're going to be sharing some of the struggles that they've had and I'm going to go through and dissect them I am uh I haven't really looked at any of their work I don't know what the concerns and issues really are yet um so I'll be going through it fresh you'll be able to see how I approach it and the the key learning and takeaway for you is not just to say oh here's a couple of random people and the problems that they face but also just to learn my approach because my approach for um tackling problems and uh solving learning or self-management related issues is usually pretty similar um even if the the, the types of problems are quite diverse so there's there's a way that you can learn to approach your own problems and sort of diagnose and be the mechanic of your own brain like i always say so um, without further ado, I will, uh, I think Janelle, we'll, we'll just start with you. I'm going to move you over to my screen here so everyone else can see you. And uh, yep, so based on the chat, it says everything looks good. That's perfect. So Janelle, um, would you mind just uh, introducing yourself? Just letting me know, uh, you know, where you're from, what your, you know, what level of education you're at and just a brief background in terms of like, you know, what are you studying and what are some of the issues that you are facing? Hello, I'm Janelle. I'm a second year bio student in Canada. Um, I guess right now I'm very unsure what my problems are because I just changed my methods. Um, throughout first year, I mostly relied on Anki practice problems. That's basically what I would use, a lot of Anki. And I thought that was like, it worked a lot in the beginning. I got really good midterm grades. I'd get 90%, almost 100. It'd be good, but by the end of it, I would crash and burn. And I'd do pretty bad on my finals just because I couldn't study anymore. So mm. that's why I'm changing. And I kind of moved on to like, mind maps and higher order thinking but i'm struggling a lot with that okay so we'll, we'll definitely um jump into that a little bit more can you tell me a little bit more like so you said that it, it made you kind of crash when you were just using your previous methods when you say you sort of crash what do you mean by that i i think i just didn't want to do it anymore <laughs> like uh I, i'd be so tired i'd have to I, i'd have to make all those cards then i'd have to review them and then, well, I'd go, I'd go through my material. I'd have to understand everything in detail. Then I would go one by one, put those into cards. Then after that, I have to review them. And then I have to do that over and over, keep reviewing. And then plus on top of all my other courses, I'd, I'd, I'd just given up and, mm. uh, yeah, I didn't really want to study anymore. Right. So it sounds like you were just getting pretty overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, the higher order stuff and the mind mapping that you've been trying, uh, you've been saying that you, you struggled with that a little bit. Um, what what are the methods that you're trying to use? And then what are the parts that you're finding quite difficult? Well, since I'm pretty new to this, um, I haven't been, I haven't been like, uh, before a lecture, I haven't been pre-reading my notes. I probably should be doing that. Mm -hmm. But after class, I usually look for... Uh, key terms and then i i can connect those together somewhat but mm. then afterwards once i get into the key terms i start thinking about all these details um i start yeah i start thinking about all these details i'm not really sure where to go mm. from there so are you sort of saying that you, you you start thinking about these details and because you're kind of getting into the details you feel like you're losing your kind of higher order train you're sort of just getting sucked down into memorizing all the different details like you were trying to do before um yeah i'd say so is that like is that kind of the the issue that you're facing or is the issue slightly different mm, i'd say also just trouble creating relation ships i guess Mm. so they're, they're probably well. yeah they're probably going to go hand in hand in that you're going to struggle yeah. with creating relationships and that's going to stop you from staying away from the details and okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to i guess talk a little bit just about the just a general approach 
um, to make sure that we're on the same page. And to, so for everyone watching, we're all on the same page. And then sort of go through in a way like a checklist of the things that you need to make sure that you're doing. And then we'll try to figure out which parts of that checklist you might not quite be hitting. And I've got an idea about what the likely problems are that you're facing because it's a very um, kind of like typical type of issue that yeah. you've got. Um, so I'm very confident that we can get onto that. Um, but to make this a comprehensive learning experience for everyone that's watching, I'll just go through all the basics and the principles as well. So if this is something that you're already familiar with because you watch all my other content, then number one, well done. Um, and number two, uh, it'll be a little bit basic. So I'm just going to move you off the screen, Janelle, so I can see the, uh, everyone can see the white board or the green board that I've got here. Um, yeah, please don't draw on it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Um, okay, so the, the the way that this works is that um, there, there, there are some basic principles that we have to follow from not just higher order learning, but from like a system, a, a learning system. So I'll just go through and, and, and talk about some of those ones instead. So when we talk about a learning system, this is very different from learning as a singular technique. And this is because a system is composed of multiple techniques. And the idea is that no single technique is going to be good enough to cover all of your needs. You must have a stack of techniques which complement each other and enhance each other. And so the, the first big part of a learning system should be the way that you're doing your pre-study. Um, pre-study or, 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 or priming. And I'll go into the, the way that this um, builds on itself shortly. And then after that, we've got what I often call the main learning event main learning event or main learning experience. So for most people going through formal education, that's going to be a class. It's going to be a lecture. Um, if you're not attending lectures, which a lot of people aren't, um, then the main learning event could just be your first dedicated long sit down study session. The main learning event really just means the, the experience that you have where you're really going through and consuming content in like a really concentrated way. That's going to be your main learning event. And then after that, you've got retrieval practice. Uh, and retrieval practice is often something that has, has to happen uh, multiple times, depending on how much time we've got available for it. So these are, the, these are the different components that we have to have. And you already mentioned that you are not always doing your pre-study and you, you're, you're sort of skipping that sometimes. Yeah. So that, that, that's going to be a uh, very just generally disadvantageous move because your pre-study is really the thing that plugs the hole in your, in your bucket, right? It's, um, you, can, you can always catch up on stuff if you fall behind, but if you've got so much that you're falling behind on that all of your time is spent catching up, then it's very difficult to ever really catch up because like the hole in the bottom of your bucket is, is kind of like larger than the speed that you're able to refill it. The pre-study is a thing that kind of closes that hole. It's the thing that uh, reduces the amount that you're forgetting in the first place. So even though in the short term, let's say that you've got an hour on a Sunday and you're making a decision, should I spend this hour on pre-study versus reviewing the stuff that I'm maybe falling behind on? You should really always choose to spend it on the pre-study because yes, you'll be falling behind on that hour's worth of material for that week or something. However, for the, for the week to come, you're going to have less that you're falling behind on which means that you're going to be in a better position. So, so you can eventually recover and catch up from that, even if you take that short-term loss. Um, so I would, you know, the, the, the first thing that I'd say, number one is a really high priority thing is really you should not be skipping out on pre-study. It's, it's really one of the most important things that you can try to do to reduce the overwhelm. Your ability to tackle the learning during the main learning event, your ability to do the retrieval effectively, the amount of stuff you need to go through in your retrieval practice, all of these things are going to be impacted by how well your brain has been primed to receive that knowledge, which usually happens in the pre-study. Okay, and that's directly a segue into some of the higher order methods and where you might be having some of those issues. Um, so let's just uh, pull this out here. So ultimately, with with anything that we're doing, we're, we're, we're trying to do this higher 
higher order learning, which I talk about all the time. And if you're not aware of what that is, then please check out my other videos as well. The most like the, the, the simplest possible way that we can think about doing higher order learning is that we're giving meaning to new information by putting it into a network. The, the meaning and value of the information is being placed in relation to other pieces of information. And it's almost to the point where it's like, no matter how you achieve that, as long as you're able to create meaning through relating it to other information, you're going to achieve that. And so there's, there's lots of ways that we can try to do that. We can try to create, and, and I'm going to give you a bunch of different ways that you can try to trigger higher order learning. And I want you to think about this. It's like, in what way does this relate information to other information to give it meaning? So creating analogies. So creating an analogy is a way that we trigger higher order learning, right? So that if we think about that, that's because in order to create an analogy, you can't really create an analogy on like a single thing. An analogy is almost like a story in a way. There's multiple components and they have to flow and relate and interact with each other in a way that actually makes sense. So there's the value judgment of that as well to understand, does this actually make sense or not? Um, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's a more explicit way that we can um, create these relationships, which is literally just to think and ask ourselves, how is this information related to what I've just learned? Or the alternative, which is how is this information related to what I already know and relating it to our prior knowledge? Um, there's also... You could, we could ask ourselves, what is the relevance to this information in the big picture? So we can think about it from a zoomed out lens to form a big picture. But all of these different kind of mental strategies, they require you to compare the information with other pieces of information. And so something that makes this really, really hard to do, which Janelle, you've actually already kind of mentioned, is that if you start getting down right into the details then it becomes really, really overwhelming because there's just too many things to try to uh, hold on to. And an analogy that I, I, I've really been using a lot recently when I've been teaching this concept is to think of learning like a jigsaw puzzle. So you know what I mean by jigsaw puzzle? Like you still use yeah, that word yeah. in Canada? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully everyone in the chat, you know what I mean by a jigsaw puzzle? Actually, let me, I'm actually curious because I use this analogy a lot, a lot. Can you let me know in the chat, is there anyone who comes from a country where the word jigsaw puzzle is like, you don't know what that means. I would, I would like to know that. Anyway, so this, this uh, if, if, you're, if you're solving a jigsaw puzzle, like how, does, how do you first start? You start with just a box full of like puzzle pieces, right? Janelle, have you, have you solved many puzzles before, personally? Oh uh, yeah, I have like a box of puzzles right there in front of me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so when you solve a puzzle, how do you start? Like, what do you do? What's your process? Oh, I just like, I look at the picture. Like, I look at the picture on the box, right? Yeah. So that's the obvious one. You look at, in fact, you probably yeah. don't even buy it if you didn't even know what the picture on the box looks like yeah, for most yeah. people. So you look at the picture on the box and then what? You open the box and you see all the pieces that are in the box. What do you do next? Oh, yeah. I, I sort them out. I like go with edges and then like sort them by color. Exactly. And like sort by the inside pieces. Now, I want you to think about the process you're using to do that. You're sorting out and you're, you're kind of like grouping the pieces together based on similarities that they have that you feel are meaningful, right? So the edge yeah. pieces you sort together because you know that the edge pieces are meaningful because they form the outer boundary. They're like the easiest things. Like... You don't, you don't like, you know where it's going to fit. Like it's going to be somewhere on that edge. You don't know where on that edge necessarily at first, but you know, it's going to be somewhere on the edge. So they're kind of the easiest places to start often, right? So you know that you can group those edge pieces together. And then when you have, I'll just bring you back because I'm talking to you. Um, and then when you have all your edge pieces clustered together, then, you know, maybe for example, uh, let's say that you're, you're, you're doing a jigsaw puzzle of like someone riding a bike through a city, you know, and then you can say, okay, well, all these like blue pieces are probably part of the sky. 
So you might get all the like blue looking pieces together and like say, okay, that, that might be like the sky. And you might have all the parts that look like the, I don't know, the, the house. And you, you know, kind of maybe group some of those together. And you, then you probably have some pieces that are left over that you like don't really know where it fits. Um, and so you might just like not group them or you put them in like a miscellaneous pile of just like random pieces that probably go somewhere, but you don't really know exactly where it goes, right? So that's that's the process that you use when you're solving a jokester puzzle, right? Yes, yeah. makes sense, yeah. So that is the exact same process that we want to use when we're learning new information. The difference is you don't know what the big picture is gonna look like it's a jigsaw puzzle that doesn't have an image on it. And actually there are jigsaw puzzles that you can buy that don't have the image on. Like you got to figure it out yourself. It's like a, you know, like a really painful way to do a jigsaw puzzle, but some people really love that. So if you're doing that, your strategy is still going to be the same. If you've got a jigsaw puzzle where you don't even know what it's going to look like at the end, it's the exact same process you're going to use. You're probably still going to look for the edge pieces and then you're still going to look at each piece to see how they might be similar to each other. And so instead of forming these groups that you're like a little bit more certain about, you'd form these groups of pieces that are like slightly more hypothetical, sorry, not hypothetical, that are more of a hypothesis, right? You're like, maybe these pieces are grouped together. Like I think, like they're all very similar colors. I think they might all be related to something and you don't know what picture it forms yet, but you're at least trying to group them together to create some kind of meaning from them, right? You following along so far yeah. with this analogy? It makes sense, right? Yeah. Now imagine trying to solve this jigsaw puzzle, but instead of, uh, you know, doing it this way, you take one piece and you look at this piece, you try to memorize exactly what this piece looks like. And once you feel like you've completely memorized what this piece looks like, you put it down and you pick up another piece and you memorize exactly what that piece looks like. And you understand everything about this piece. You know how many millimeters one edge is, you know, you, you know exactly the color and it goes from like one shade to another shade. You know, there's a gradient and there's like a three millimeter like dot of red on the corner. Like, you know, every single thing about this. And then once you've memorized it completely, you put it down and you pick up another piece. Imagine solving a jigsaw puzzle by doing that and trying to like form the picture somehow through having memorized each individual piece. Like how long would it take to solve a jigsaw puzzle by doing it that way? Right, you can imagine yeah, that. Yeah, pretty long. Yeah, in yeah. fact, I, I would say like, if you could even do that, like, I, 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 feel like, I feel like it would be literally impossible. Like, I think I could spend my whole life trying to solve a single jigsaw puzzle that way and maybe like never finish it. Like by the time I'm on my like fourth or fifth piece, I've honestly just forgotten the first piece anyway. So then I would have to spend time to like pick up my first piece every five pieces and like constantly review it. And this is the reason, and, and this is how, you know, most people use flashcards, right? So if, yeah. you know, if, if those of you watching and listening right now didn't realize, this has all been an analogy for learning. Uh, so this, you know, this is how most people use flashcards is that they will just like focus really, really intensely on just memorizing and understanding a single piece really, really deeply. And then they will just, rely on trying to form this big picture eventually if they ever get time to do that, which often they don't get time to do that. Um, which is why some people will sit an exam and then during the exam, they'll be like, wow, everything actually, like this question made me realize and it made sense of the topic. Like they're learning during the exam, which is not what you want to happen. So your brain wants to form that big picture image. Once it understands the big picture image, it has, it has more relevance, it has more meaning, and therefore it's easier to remember and it's easier to make sense of and it's easier to use that knowledge. So the most important thing that we need to do when we're learning is sift through the pieces to try to create that big picture, right? And because we don't know what the picture looks like initially, our big picture is gonna be a hypothesis. We're gonna, there's a hypothesis that we think the big picture looks a certain way and we're gonna create these groups and we're gonna, we're gonna work with them to see if that is truly the picture uh, that we have hypothesized. And we're probably gonna be wrong, but as we're continuing to build it out, it's gonna become clearer and clearer and clearer and more and more easy to do that. So um, Janelle, probably what's happening here is that right now, the reason that you're struggling 
probably is because you have a lot of the um, kind of habits of like trying to memorize each individual piece. Yeah. And then when you start like laying down some of the edge pieces and you pick up a piece, you kind of fall into the habit of like trying to memorize that piece instead of immediately just like trying to play around with it and, and, and create these groups. And so there's two things that you can do to try to train yourself out of that. Well, the first thing is being aware of it, which is, it's like the zero with thing. It's just being aware that you, you should try not to do that. Um, but just like you would when you, when you have a, a jigsaw puzzle, you've said that you've got your key terms. And when you go through the key terms, when you try to group those key terms together, I want you to think about it very consciously by asking yourself why you think grouping it grouping these terms a certain way makes sense or, or is important or relevant. Don't just group things together because you feel like they could be grouped together. Actually explicitly think about what type of group you think this represents and why that group is valuable or meaningful. It's just like when you're solving a jigsaw puzzle, you'd, you'd group them together because you have a hypothesis that this forms the sky or the road or the house. When you're grouping the ideas together, you want to know exactly what that group represents. Because remember, your hypothesis is probably going to be wrong initially. And so you want to be able to know why you're grouping it so that when you, ref when you reflect on it and you adjust it, you're actually making a meaningful adjustment. It's not just kind of like, oh, this group didn't work. And now you're kind of just left with all these isolated concepts again, right? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a clear hypothesis that you're testing. With each group that you form, always come back to your existing set of groups and see if the picture is getting clearer. If the picture is not getting clearer, change your groups around. That's the second thing. As, uh, just like with a jigsaw puzzle, as you continue to solve it, it should be getting easier because the picture is forming, right? Like the first, the, the hardest, like the easiest part is forming the edge. And then the hardest part is actually forming like the next layer that comes in from the edge. But once you've got that, it gets easier and easier because there's less pieces that you need to work through and there's more of a big picture that's forming. So it's more about just like filling in the gaps. The easiest part about, uh, you know, the higher order learning process is forming your first initial groups. The hard part is refining those groups to see what actually forms the clearer picture. So you'd do this. Let me get my green board out again. This is what you'd do. You, number one, uh, you form groups. And as we said, these groups, they have to be very, very explicit. Um, really like challenge your reasoning. Don't just, don't just like make these groups and say, oh, they feel like they all kind of related together or like, oh, they, they are under the same chapter heading or like, oh, my lecturer spoke them within the same minute of each other. Like these are not good reasons. Like you have to have a group that even if you were to just give it to some random other person, they would look at these same groups and think, think yes, that's a very logical way of grouping it together. So make really, really explicit groups. And then number two, continue to refine each group by comparing to the big picture. And this, this is kind of like a, a cyclical process that occurs. So every time you form a group, you then look at the other groups you've formed and then you try to bring it together. And then you ask yourself, okay, now I, instead of one group, I've got two groups. Do these two groups actually make sense with each other? Like, does it actually form like a more cohesive story for this topic? If the answer is no, maybe we try one more group, see if we can build out that story a little bit more. So we create another group. And once we've grouped that, and then we put it together and try to create a flow to see how they interact with each other, we ask ourselves again, like, did this make it clearer? Is the big picture of this topic becoming clearer to me? If the answer is still no, after like three groups, probably the way that you've grouped it needs to be changed. So what you do is you just break the groups, you bring them out into the original terms again, you look for an alternative way to group the information.
And this process of just going back and forth, grouping and ungrouping and checking and making sure that it makes sense and just asking yourself this question of like, does it make sense? Can I group this group it this way? This takes time. This takes effort. And in fact, it takes uh, like literal resources. You need to go into your learning materials. You need to read your textbook. You need to Google things to figure out whether this group makes sense or not. And all of that is going to be effective for learning. By the time you do this process again and again, you'll have like your major groups formed for the overall topic. And then you're going to group them again. Like you're going to form subgroups with, within those big groups. You're going to form, and, and so it's exactly the same process, but you're just having smaller and smaller groups until you get to the point where there's nothing to group anymore. They're just individual concepts. But by doing that, you're actually building on a web. So if you're, if you're using like a mind map kind of technique, it should, it should look something like this. I'll just move this over here so we can still see that. Hopefully you can all see that still. Yeah. So at first you'd have just like a list of kind of concepts that, that are there. And then you will take these concepts and then you'd try to think, okay, can I group it into this one? And then can I group uh, maybe this one and these together into another group? And then maybe I can group this one and this one and this one into another group. And then so you'd have these three groups together. And you'd think, how could these groups relate to each other potentially? And you might say, okay, well, there's maybe this kind of thing that works. And you might say, actually, that doesn't make sense. So you'd get rid of that. And then you'd go back to the list and you'd form a different type of group. So maybe you'd group it, you know, this way instead. So, and then you do that until you get to a point where you're actually pretty comfortable with the fact that you've got these kind of main groups and you understand the relationship that these groups have with each other. And then once you're at that point, you then will be branching it out. And then when you branch it out, you're going to ask the same question. Does this relationship make sense? Does this continue to make sense? And so as you continue it to expand out over time, this gets increasingly larger and more complex. And then once you've fleshed that out more fully, you can go through to see if you can simplify it even more. At no point during this process, are you ever reading or consuming information for any other reason than to see whether the groups and flow that you've created makes sense. That's key here. As soon as you start consuming information, just for the sake of consuming information, or as soon as you start covering material, just because it's there, that's when you start losing because that's now falling into a lower order habit. The, the, the intention, the reason, the purpose for consuming the information needs to be to solve the puzzle, to form the picture. And that framing means that you, you can read the same sentence, the exact same paragraph, the same list of bullet points, but it has more meaning to you because it forms part of a bigger picture. If you really, really, really struggle with holding yourself accountable to, to thinking in this way, actually set yourself a timer, maybe every five minutes or 10 minutes, set a timer that just goes off. And every time the timer goes off, you, you stop, you pause, and you ask yourself, am I consuming and reading and learning for the sake of figuring out the big picture? Or am I just reading it because I, I, I got sucked into a paragraph and I'm just trying to understand it? Am I trying to understand so that I can clarify my groups and my relationships and create a flow that I feel like makes sense? Or am I just reading to understand? The understanding, um, like understanding and good memory are a side effect and a symptom of creating a good organizational structure. Uh, it's not the primary outcome. We don't aim to get memory and understanding. Memory and understanding are formed as part of forming a good organizational structure. Uh, I think that's really crucial to understand because uh, it's, it's counterintuitive. Uh, it's counterintuitive that when you try to deliberately create better memory and understanding by trying to remember and understand, it's actually less efficient 
than trying to create structure and meaning at a big picture level where the, mem the memorization and understanding come as part of that. And then after you've done that, then you'd go through and see what you've forgotten. And then that stuff, you can chuck into your flashcards and your Anki, but you'd have only 20% of what you'd normally have because you've already remembered and understood the rest. So that's kind of just like a like an end-to-end -end sort of flow there that I've kind of rambled on about so far. Um, Janelle, did you have any, like b based on what I've just said right now, and you kind of reflect on your own learning methods, which, yeah, like, which part of what I said to you feels maybe like different to what you might already be doing or like really stands out as like, okay, that's something that I'm kind of catching myself on. Um, I think one thing that stood out to me probably was that your hypothesis can be wrong. Cause when I put it onto Anki, it's like, I have this information that's like chuck it onto the card and that's the information like the idea that i can be wrong but i can go back and change it and keep rearranging it's pretty foreign to me i'd say yeah and i think that's um so th it's a really interesting concept because like there's a level of uncertainty right like when 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 you're like not sure how everything fits together it creates this confusion and uncertainty and it can even cause like insecurity but that state of mind where you're really like confused is actually really good for learning because it puts your brain in this kind of problem solving mode and therefore like that like confusion is a sign that your brain is trying to figure something out which is exactly what you want like imagine doing a jigsaw puzzle where like there is no confusion whatsoever you just literally pick up all the pieces and you just like it's it's just like a procedure like duh, 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 like you're just filling it like some kind of robot you know that number 1 would be insane but also number two you know it's like there, there's there's obviously no like mental engagement going on there so that if you're feeling confused and you're feeling like uncertain and you're like not sure how it all fits together and like that that's the feeling that you have while you study that's actually a good thing like that's a that's a sign that you're really trying to think in the right way don't avoid that like if you if you try to avoid that by just focusing on understanding all the individual details, that's when you fall into the trap because you haven't actually crystallized it. You haven't actually solved it. All you've done is you've just left the puzzle on the table and you've gone to do something else, right? It's still unsolved. And, you know, if, if in, in an exam, that's how you're being tested, you're going to wish you had spent the time to solve that in advance. Are there any other aspects that I've kind of talked about that you have some questions or uncertainties on or you need some clarification around? Um, I guess also, I don't, I don't know if I have a question right now, but the idea of you like saying uncertainty is okay. Uh, Cause I'm also very used to, cause what they say in school is, oh, you have to under, you always have to understand yeah. the material before you put it into the problem set. So that's, that's once I start going into the mind map, I'd be so, I'd be so lost. I'm like, where, where is this going? Yeah. Like, it seems like I don't really have like a goal. Yeah. So I, clarity I is your weird. goal. What, what I'm saying is uncertainty is, 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 is a good part of the process. You don't want to stay uncertain forever, but yeah. the uncertainty is like the necessary part to get to certainty. That's actually meaningful. Because the worst case scenario is that you get to certainty, but the certainty is based on like an illusion of knowledge. Like you don't actually know it. You just think you know it. And so what they say in school is often like, yeah, you need to understand things. Okay, first of all, teachers are not trained on learning science. So actually what they say in school is not reflective yeah. of like up to date, you know, like methods and knowledge. And I'm not like bagging on teachers. It's just not part of their training. It's not really primarily their job. Um, but the other thing is that it's not, it's not that it's wrong. You do have to understand it. But what we're talking about right now is the process that you use to get to the understanding, right? It's like saying, okay, you need to build a house. You can build a house in many different ways. You can choose to build an entire house with a single screwdriver. And if you do that, your hands are going to bleed and you're going to be building that house for like 20 years. And it's going to be amazing if you can actually build a house with a single screwdriver. 
there is a more effective way of building the house. You use different tools at different times uh, and, and, and through a different process. The understand again, the understanding is the symptom of the process. So yes, you have to get to understanding, but the more efficient and more robust way of getting to the understanding happens to use a process that at first has a lot of uncertainty as part of it, right? In a way, you can kind of think about it like this. It's like the uncertainty means that you are aware of what you do not know. And as soon as, and you're opening yourself up to all the things you don't know. So you're, it's really clear. And then you are systematically addressing the things that you don't know. And that's the process through which you're arriving at certainty and understanding. But we're starting from being like, okay, let's, let's get everything we don't know on the table first. Like, let's be clear about what our uncertainty is. And let's start working through the uncertainty to, to find the meaning in that. Whereas if you start from a position where you're not aware of where your uncertainties are, and then you're trying to go through and, and gain certainty, you're sort, of, you're sort of like tricking yourself and then you're avoiding finding those gaps. And then what happens is that those gaps get revealed to you eventually anyway. And, and actually that's a lot worse because it causes, that can cause a lot of anxiety and a lot of problems because then you'll be studying, but your internal sense of like how good your learning is going is not accurate anymore. So if you do worse in an exam, you don't know why and you don't know how to fix it because you don't know where it went wrong because when you were studying, it actually felt good. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but good question. Good question. For the sake of time, um, we're going to move on to Sonia. Uh, but Janelle, please like keep keep thinking of questions and things and then hopefully towards the end of this, we'll, we'll, I will just come back and see if there's any other questions um, for you. But um, okay, okay. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Sonia, I'm going to bring you onto the, uh, hold on. It's going to spotlight you on here. Spotlight. Yeah. Sonia, could you please, um, just introduce yourself? Just, you know, uh, where are you from? What educational stage are you? What type of stuff are you learning? Uh, and what are some of the struggles that you've been facing? Yeah, my name is Sonia. I'm from India and uh, India has many states. So I'm from Haryana. So I have done my bachelor in education and I have done masters in psychology and I have done a diploma in guidance and counseling also. So uh, I'm preparing for NET. It is an exam in India for assistant professors so that we can teach in colleges or universities. Uh, the problem I'm facing is that I'm not being able to be consistent throughout my studies and I'm not revising the stuff. I'm only further and further study. Mm. Yeah. So, so uh, there's a couple of things that you mentioned there. Number one was that you don't have the consistency. And then the second thing was that you yeah. aren't revising. You're just kind of studying further. So that second point, uh, do you mean that, um, you don't have time to like review what you've already learned and you're just spending all of your time just like learning more and more and more things. Is that what you meant by that? Yeah. Okay. And, is, and, and why is, so actually why is it for both? So what's the reason you're not consistent when you say you're, you're con what do you, what do you mean when you say you're not consistent? Uh, see, as I am a mother of two, so I'm not able to be consistent throughout my studies. Mm -hmm. Is that just because of lack of time, too many responsibilities, yeah. too many things you're trying to juggle? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, and too many responsibilities. So when you say you're not consistent, what does that look like? It means what you study on one day and then you're not able to study on another day? Or is it that you plan to study on one day, but then something happens and then you can't? And then you, you, know, you plan to study on another day and sometimes you can. And like, so what does, what does it mean? I want to really be able to visualize what it means for you to be inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, I make my sh uh, schedules for daily and one day I'm consistent. I am doing whatever I have planned for me and next day something comes up to me and uh, so I'm not able to do next schedules that I have scheduled for me. Mm, okay. 
so there's two there's there's a, there's a couple different ways that we can try to try to tackle this. Um, so what's really important here for for me as a coach is to really understand where the root cause is. And it's not to say that there's always one root cause. Uh, there's usually multiple reasons that things happen, but we need to really understand the root cause. Otherwise, the advice I give you is not going to be very effective. So I'm thinking about it from two different angles right now. Is it a time and task management problem or is it a kind of learning aspect um, aspect problem? And it could be both, right? So it could be time and task management in that there are some methods and techniques that you could use that make your schedules more flexible and more adaptable, that make it so that when things arise, you're able to you're able to roll with it and you're able to um, adapt and overcome a little bit more easily. So that could be one possible uh, angle. The other possible angle is that your method of learning could be too either time consuming or too um, too big, too cumbersome. Like it, you need to sit down at your desk and have perfect silence and you need to have you know all of your books out in front of you and you need at least two hours. And like there could be too many requirements for you to have effective learning that makes it so that, man, your time management would have to be amazing to be able to study and fulfill all those requirements. And that's what I'm trying to work out right now. Um, based on that, do, do you have an idea about which one, wh where you think the issue is? Or maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe there's some time management methods you could use that make you more adaptable. And then maybe there's some ways that your learning could be a little bit more flexible as well. Or is it just more one than the other? What do you think? No, both I have time management also. As see, sometimes I'm studying for uh, four to five hours continuously a study. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't get time to study for one to two hours also. Mm. Okay. So if you, let's say that, let's say that you had only, um, let's say that you had 30 minutes. You got 30 minutes available. Yeah. Would you be, do you, would you feel that you can use that 30 minutes of time to study effectively? Uh, I can use that. You can use that. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so let's say that you've got a, you know, you've got a, a, a busy day, you've got lots of things going on, but between each thing, each ev event, you have an hour available, right? So, but just before lunch, you've got an hour and then, uh, you know, at three o'clock, you've got another hour and then at, you know, 8 PM, you've got another hour. So throughout the day, you've got three hours. Do you feel yeah. that if you had those slots of time, and if there, if there are no distractions that stop you from using that time, do you feel that the method that you use to learn would allow you to get some good learning done within those little one hour blocks? Yes, I can do that. Okay. So therefore, I think the problem is probably to do with the time management side, right? Because if you're able to study effectively yeah, in those one hour blocks, then your, your learning method is probably going to be, uh, you know, not going to be the thing that's limiting you yet. So when we think about the way that we're um, managing time and tasks, it's important that we're thinking about the two differently. I'll start with the time management side of things. So time management is really fundamentally, it's just about how you schedule and then how you adjust your schedule. It's, it's really, that's, that's all it is. Um, when you create a, a, a daily schedule, What's your approach to doing that? I want you to like walk me through exactly what you would do as soon as you start your scheduling process. Like, do you have a, a calendar? Do you have an app? You know, what do you fill in first? Um, how do you decide how your day is going to look like? No, actually, I'm not making any schedule in return. I'm just thinking whenever I get time, I have to study. In morning, I study after nine. And to 1 p.m. Okay, I'm going to write this down. So I'm going to bring this screen over here. Sorry, I'm just uh, adjusting my screen share here. Okay, that'll do. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so uh, just go walk through that again for me, please. So you're not uh, you're morning, not making a schedule. schedule yeah no no in return i'm not making but i uh, whenever i get time i study uh, see okay. up to eight my children have gone to school mm -hmm. 
uh, after that i do one for one hour, i do my household chores mm-hmm. and after 9 mm-hmm. i start studying and up to 1 i do it i want to do it regularly but i am not consistent in that sometime i skip these okay and what's the reason that you would skip it see many uh, many time many time i have other tasks also of household chores mm-hmm. or something i have to go to market and so that's why i'm facing problem okay and these other tasks are they predictable or not predictable are uh, predictable they they are sometimes pre- not sometimes not but sometimes are yeah okay. so um how let's just say as a general percentage how many of your tasks that of these tasks that just come up that you you know are predictable um versus not predictable like 50 50 or maybe like more unpredictable or more predictable uh 50 50 yeah 50-50. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um Okay, so there's this 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 straight off the bat there's like two or three things that I think that you can do that will that will help you. Um but I want to get a little bit more information first. Um how's your how's your focus and your attention and your and your energy and your ability to kind of uh you know do work and study and things throughout the day generally pretty good most of the day or do you are there certain times of the day or certain periods or certain things that really tire you out and after that you just can't study see i'm very much focused for 9 to 1 from 9 to 1 and one. after that yeah after that my children come from school right. and so after that i can't study right and then i are, are you basically done you, like from After after your children come home, you're just done for the whole day, or do you get like a little pocket somewhere during that time where you're okay again? No, at night I get uh, after nine, I get time. Okay, and then after nine you get time. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. Now sometimes, okay, not always, but sometimes, um, is it possible during the day also for you to be able to focus? and not like you know maybe uh maybe your kids are playing or doing something or doing homework or whatever that they might be doing where you can have kind of like a focus time maybe they've got a focus time maybe everyone's doing a focus time but is there some way that you can actually have some time during the day that's like protected and focused and your kids also know like you know i i shouldn't be shouldn't be you know bothering her Yeah in front uh, whenever I study in front of my children they know that they do not have to bother me Okay so so in that case when you say that your children come home at 1 p.m. and then you're not able to focus is that because it's not that your children are bothering you but because you're just thinking about your children being there that makes you like what's the reason that it's hard to focus mm. when your children are home Yeah Uh, yeah, because I think that I have to give time to them also. Sure, right. I mean, which is true. Uh, you do, <laughs> but okay. So there's a, you know, there's a bit of a balance here. Okay, cool. I think that's enough to work with. Okay, the first thing that I'm gonna say is that actually, um, I think the I think the main problem here is probably uh just your 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 time allocation being a little bit. sporadic um consistency is number one very important but it's very hard to get consistency if you don't have a good understanding of your current baseline um and it's very hard to get a good understanding of your current baseline if you don't have like a consistent system to go with so there's an interesting thing is that off the bat i would say that you should have a written schedule you should have actual times you should have an actual uh you know diary of times of the day where you're blocking out to do certain tasks This is not to say you need to use a schedule every single day for the rest of your life. But it does give you better clarity in terms of how you are actually spending your time and what you could do to try to reallocate that time. So for example, you might say that okay, well between um you know 7 to 8 a.m. you're going to do something and you think it's going to take you that hour. But and so you would say okay, well I think it will take me 1 hour, so you'd put it into your schedule to take 1 hour. 
Now, one of two things is going to happen. One, it's going to take you an hour. Or number two, it's not going to take you an hour. It'll either be shorter, it'll be longer. And that's valuable information. Uh, because that, that gives you a better understanding of how long your real time spend actually is. So what we're talking about here is called time tracking. Um, and that makes it much easier to plan. The other thing is that you can notice variations in how long certain things take. And this is really the case for studying. So let's say between 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., you know that that's a great focus time for you to be able to, to do things. And you can't necessarily do all of your housework and things when the when the children are home, maybe. Uh so you might say, okay, well, between 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., I'm going to study. And between 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., I'm going to do some focused like housework. And you'd say, okay, if I think about all the housework that I need to get done, an hour, maybe I can, if I'm, if I'm focused, maybe I can do everything in one hour. You might say that you can, you can do that. So you'd, you'd spend one hour. And then after an hour, you'd say, okay, have I been able to do this? Maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can. Thursday, Friday, you can't. So now this is data for you. And you ask yourself, well, why? Why is it that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I was able to do all of my housework, but then Thursday, Friday, I can't. Why did I go overtime? Or maybe every, you know, maybe, um, uh, that, you know, it, it could be that it's a certain time of the, it's a certain day of the week is always like a little bit slower. Maybe it's because of other conditions. Maybe whenever it's raining, there's more traffic. So it takes longer to get to the shop and therefore, it takes longer to do some of your household chores. So it's about understanding all the different factors that affect your ability to, to get into this flow. And then shifting your time blocks around to try to make it work as best as, as possible. So just without knowing a lot about you and your family and all the, all the chores and the household things that you need to do, there's a few things that I would suggest at least you should try and it's going to be up to you to see whether it actually works or not. I'm not going to presume that I know enough to actually just say you should you should do this. But I think you should, you should try some of these things. The first thing that I think that you should try is actually be making a very conscious decision about which household uh, chores that are predictable, okay, you can do with your children. Okay, either getting your children involved or just doing them or just getting your kids to do them for you <laughs> or um, just just doing them when they're when they're home again. Right. So that, that's the first thing I would I would try if you already know that you want to spend you know time with your children when they're home uh, and you know that it's going to be difficult for you to focus then make use of that time. You've got 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's a, it's a good focus block of time, right? And there's gonna be some things that you aren't able to do uh, when your children are home, and then you can try to do those. But I'm sure that there are things that you are doing between 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. that you could probably do when your kids are home as well, and it wouldn't make that much of a difference. And we just try to move as much of that as we can. The second thing is thinking about what are the things that take you more concentration, more energy, more attention, where you really need to be at your peak. And I would be moving those. So if we say peak concentration, and I'd be moving these peak concentration things probably into this morning area. So even in your studying, there might be certain methods of studying that you think uh, require a little bit more concentration. Um, whereas there are some, some things like, for example, you could maybe spend your nine, you could, you could block out 9 PM to 9 30 is you to just relax, have some tea, just, you know, just chill out for a little bit. And then 9 30 to 10 PM is dedicated time for you to just review through some of the material that you've studied. Maybe do, maybe, maybe just get a blank piece of paper and just do a mind map from memory. And there are lots of things that you can do in a short period of time that can prep you for more effective targeted learning when you've got more time and you're able to concentrate. So here's a, here's a common flow that I've used myself and it, it could be useful. 9.30 to 10 p.m., 30 minutes, you think of everything that you've learned during that week and then you just dump it, you just brain dump. From memory, you map out as much as you possibly can and anything that you feel not confident on or you're not sure about or you're forgetting, you just have a separate piece of paper and you just write it down. 
You don't have to go and study it. You don't have to go and learn it, but you just note down what it is that you that's weak, that's weaker. And then you go to sleep. And the next morning, you've got a piece of paper that has all of your weaknesses on it, right? And now you know exactly where to start. You can start your first study session by just going through that list because that's targeted. That's focused on what you know is a weakness for you. And you could spend the first 30 minutes of studying just covering some of those weaknesses, right? And that just means that you get into a pattern and a habit of reviewing. The third thing that I think which, uh, which builds on this is if, because one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning is that you don't have any time to review because you're just spending all of your time just learning this new material. Normally when it comes to learning, the, the knowledge tends to build. Um, within, with, you know, you, you have like a topic and then, you know, that, that topic will kind of like, the knowledge within that topic will just sort of build, right? So even when you're just learning new things, there is a way to try to review that while you are still learning the new things. And so what I think is maybe the method that you're using for learning isn't allowing you to actually build on the knowledge. It might be quite kind of like isolated. What I would recommend is try to probably in that focused period of time in this kind of morning block, try to um, like try to try to study even if it's more shallow and superficial, try to study ahead. So don't just follow the course or the program or something at the same pace. Just try to study uh, like not as deep and not as detailed, but just like bigger, broader, so that you're kind of working ahead of the content because you want to be building your knowledge in layers like this rather than in columns like this. You don't want to learn deep and detailed step by step by step. You want to be learning very shallow and wide and then building a little bit more detail on that and then building a little bit more detail on that and building a little bit more detail. And when you learn this way, it's going to be easier even if you don't have dedicated time to review what you've already learned you will naturally review it anyway because each layer is relying on you having the knowledge from the previous underlying layer. So as you get more detailed, you're testing yourself on your understanding of the basic concepts. This is, you know, this is kind of one, one sort of thing that you could do. So the, the third thing here is to layer your learning. Um, but it does mean that you often need to, um, it does mean that you often need to learn uh, slightly like different to how it's being taught to you, uh, which can be, you know, unsettling for some people, but I would, I would really recommend that you experiment with this and, and try to give it a go. Um, there's one more thing that I think would probably help you, which is number four is to schedule unpredictability. Okay, so this is kind of like a, um, you know, it's quite a foreign concept for a lot of people. Okay, think about it like this. Unexpected things will always happen, but you're not going to know what it is because they are unexpected. So, but you know it's going to happen. You don't know what it is, but you know it's going to happen. So you should actually schedule for that. Have time in your schedule that's dedicated as a just-in-case time. Just in case something happens, you've got this time that you can deal with it. And now it's planned for, and you can plan around it. Now in the best case scenario, nothing happens. Now you've got extra time and you can use that extra time for more study or whatever you wanna do, right? To catch up, to review material, that's free time for you. That's time that you've created. You can use it however you want. But in the worst case scenario, something does come up. And what you're saying is that 50% 50, 50 of the time, there's something not unpredictable that's happening. Now you've got a dedicated time that you can use to try to deal with it or deal with it as much as possible. And maybe that amount of time is not enough, but at least it's, it's better than not having anticipated it at all. It's just gonna reduce the impact that it has. So your consistency may not be 100% every single day. When an unpredictable thing happens though, it means that it's not gonna just, it's, it's not gonna go to zero. It's gonna at least be 50%, 60%. You can maintain at least some baseline level of consistency because you're scheduling in a buffer. You're scheduling in a cushion in case things go wrong, okay? So there's, there's already quite a few things there. 
Um, but obviously the, the, it starts with actually having a written schedule. I would really strongly recommend having a schedule that, um, you know, is like you're committing to paper with actual um, dates. If you, I personally use like Google Calendar because it's just easy to easy to use. You can use paper, you can use an app, whatever you're, you're comfortable with, but actually have it, track the amount of time that you're taking, get a realistic understanding of how you're spending your time and how long certain things take you. And once you're able to really understand how long certain things take you, you can then start scheduling things in advance anticipating how long things will take and then allocating your time a little bit more strategically by using these four little uh, tips that I've given you. Again, for you to experiment with. Okay, based on um, what I've told you here, are there any particular parts that stick out to you, uh, you know, that you're not certain about? No. Pretty straightforward. Okay, give that a go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, Janelle, if you're still there, if you thought of any other questions during that time, um, if you guys have any questions at all, then we'll we'll open up to that. I don't know. I want to just try to do... Yeah. Any, any, any other kind of miscellaneous questions? Uh, yeah, I had a, another question just like about the mind maps. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I do get like, I get like a decent mind map, like I get a, a decent skeleton, mm -hmm. but I have a, I actually have like a lot of just incomplete mind maps. I mentioned that like in the form, like I have a bunch of mind maps and they're kind of scattered in my iPad mm -hmm. uh, right now. I'm just wondering like how the revision process goes for like the mind map. Like you do the mind map and then the next day, like how that works, filling in all those blanks. Mm. Uh, yeah, it kind of depends. So um, are your mind maps that are incomplete on like single lectures or are they on like entire topics? Um, Like I have this one mind map of the, um, right now I have this one mind map. It's an entire topic. It's just about the, um it's just about the cell and all the different components how how, how incomplete are we talking like let's you know what percentage complete mm -hmm. is it probably like if i look at the slides maybe like 30 percent is left over 30 percent left yeah. over okay so actually not yeah, yeah okay yeah. so if, if that's the case um i think probably Okay, as a general principle, if you've got mind maps that are incomplete, it's actually worthwhile just using your revision session to just complete them. Um, yeah. And and clean them up. So the reason is because when the, it's not it's not about whether you complete the mind map or not. It's about the type of thinking that doing the mind map and doing it correctly, not just like doing a mind map, but like the thinking process that is involved in it. It's about the type of learning that that helps to facilitate. Um, so for, for a lot of people that are just starting into that higher order, um, learning space, the mind map is their vehicle to trigger that higher order learning and the thinking process that's involved in creating that mind map is what allows, you know, that, that higher order knowledge to be formed. So you don't really want to avoid that. Even if you're doing it late or, you know, whatever it is, like you want to have that happening at some point during your learning. Um, if you weren't able to get onto it earlier, that knowledge is probably not there anyway. And you need to have that knowledge formed. So it still makes sense to do it as part of your revision session. This changes if you have other methods that you're using to, to pad up your higher order learning though. So if your mind maps are just one thing, but actually you, you've got a lot of higher order learning happening through another method that you're using as well, then that changes things a little bit. But based on what you've said, I think the mind map is kind of the primary vehicle for you to engage in higher order learning, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, you're probably going to have higher order learning gaps by not having completed it. So whether you do that in the pre-study or whether you do that in your main learning event or whether you do that in your, you know, in your retrieval kind of like doesn't really make much of a difference. You just got to do it at some point anyway. You may as well just do it as part of your, as part of your revision. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Cool. Okay. Any other questions? Sonia, any questions from you as well? Uh, yeah, it is not about my struggles, but I want to ask you that how I can help uh, my kids or some other children so that uh, they can learn, they can study. Yeah, so uh, my advice for any parent, um, and I actually had a, I actually had a podcast uh, recently, not, not my podcast, I was invited as a guest onto, onto a podcast. I think it's coming out in a, maybe a, a couple months. So I'd really recommend watching that podcast. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll post it on all my social media and whatever when it, it is released. But the most important thing is to understand that the achievements of your child when they're young don't really matter. Um, what's important is the mindset and the attributes and the person that that is building for the challenges that, that they will face later in life. And one of the things that I see a lot is that what's overemphasized is the actual outcome and achievement in these early, you know, years. Like, you, you, did you say your kids are eight years old? Uh, my uh, daughter is 11 and my son is seven. 11 and seven, yeah. So definitely seven, yeah, pretty, pretty young. 11 also, you know, still very young. So the, um, the worst thing that we can do is really emphasize like achievement like getting the certain you know, particular outcome. Because when you're young, you don't actually have enough nuance to understand what it means for, for, for an outcome to be achieved or for it to be difficult or for the process involved in it. Like all the things that we're talking about right now, this is too advanced for like a young child to really understand. What they understand is outcome and um, acceptance. So... If a child starts thinking, my parent only is proud of me, accepts me, only cares about when I do well, then what create what that creates is a sense of identity that is essentially based on achieving a certain outcome. And again, because they're too young to really like understand the nuance, what that means is that it doesn't create a child that's driven to succeed. It does the opposite. It creates a child that is terrified of failing. Which means that they will ne they, they, they avoid mistakes, they avoid experimentation, they avoid growth. Because that means that they may make a mistake. They avoid challenges. Because if it's challenging, they might fail. And if they fail, they will not be loved, they will not be accepted, they're not a worthwhile human being. Uh, and then they feel, they, they feel that their entire self-worth is based on being a high achiever, achieving a certain outcome. And that is completely limiting for growth and for life. That method of thinking is not compatible with a healthy, uh, healthy and thriving and successful life, right? Because that mistake and failure is, is paramount. So what is the way that you could help other people, your children, other children, uh, be successful academically is actually to stop focusing on the helping them with the studying. What we need to help them with is the stuff that I was talking uh, talking about before with Janelle is help, help them see learning as a process of problem solving and making mistakes. Help them see the value in the mistakes that they're making. Uh, see the value in thinking about a process and understanding why things happen and how we can control why things happen. Create a sense of identity that takes pride and ownership and being a person that figures things out and isn't afraid to make mistakes when everyone else is. And then that child will grow into an adult that can just tackle anything, right? That would be, that. that's my biggest, you know, biggest thing. That's the, that's the message that I tell parents all the time. And it's a message that I'll always continue to tell, to tell, tell parents forever. That's a good question. And I think that's probably the, all the time that we've got for this session. Sonia and Janelle, thank you very much for coming on and, and participating in this. It was like super last minute, literally like hours before we went live. We we're just like, yo, can you, can you come on? Uh, so thank you for um, being willing to do that. It's very brave and it's very generous 
to be on a live stream, you know, on a, on a channel and talk about some of the difficulties and your struggles. I know that most people would not be, you know, brave enough and um, be willing to, to do that. So everyone in the chat, please, you know, say thank you. Leave your appreciation for Sonia and Janelle. Um, we'll wrap that up there. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope this has been informative for you. Please, again, it's not about Sonia and Janelle's problems for you, obviously. Think about the way that I'm dissecting things. There's a few things here. I'm always thinking about the root cause. I'm always trying to get to the bottom of why certain problems exist. Um, you can never fix anything if you don't know exactly why it's happening. So I'm trying my hardest to characterize it and get all that information out. Um, and you have that information in your own, you know, in your own reflection. So just get into that habit of reflecting and trying to diagnose your own problems and experimenting with solutions. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, and we'll, we'll end it there if I can figure out how to end the stream, which seems to be this. So thanks everyone. See you later. And I think